I want to talk this morning uh, about a tale of, of three daughters. Uh, three daughters. Uh, and, and we would subtitle it maybe uh, Issues Resolved and Identity Restored, or it could all be summed up in the one subject of identity, knowing who we are in Christ. And uh, we're going to start in Matthew chapter number 9, verse 18 through 26. But before we go there, we're going to go to 2 Corinthians 5, 17. I'm going to have you all over the Bible because I want to, when we, when we get up here and share a word from the Lord with you, we just don't want to share our opinions. We want to tell you what the word says. We want to share what the word of the Lord says. And if anything that comes from this pulpit or anywhere that can't be backed up with the word, don't ever believe it. But if it can be backed up with the word, we either have to change the way that we think so our thinking comes in alignment with the word, or we have to just say, okay, I'm not going to receive that. Tear that page out of the Bible. Tear that one out. Tear that. Pretty soon you would have a Bible that would just be a few pages. But we, we believe all of it, don't we? From Genesis to Revelation... Come on, where y'all at now? Y'all are so excited. We start talking about believing the word of the Lord, and y'all, the volume starts going down. We believe, we believe the indexes, the maps, the <laughs> I mean everything, everything, everything. If it's in there, we're going to take it. We'll have it. 2 Corinthians 5.17, we're talking about identity. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, who is in Christ today? Yeah. If anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away, and look, new things have come. Are you looking at the things that have passed, or are you looking for the new things that are coming? And so this word new here in the Greek language is kainos. So he says, if anyone is in Christ, he is a kainos creation. That word kainos is a, a new species of being that has never existed before. Let me tell you, a creature with new features. So, unprecedented, uncommon, never seen before. And, of course, we understand that Jesus is the prototype of this kainos creation, the second Adam who has come to fully restore the DNA and the genetics of mankind. And where he talks about in Isaiah that he will restore the desolate generations of many, the desolate cities and the desolate generations of many generations. That word generations, uh, if you look up the, the original Hebrew word, it translates into the DNA or the genetics of mankind. We understand that our bodies and our minds only operate at a very small capacity of which they have to operate in. Most people's brains, it says, uh, um, many reports say they, the average person's brain operates at about a 10% capacity of what it could. Are you sitting beside somebody who operates about a 1%? No, no. <laughs> most, most are operating at about a 10, about a 10 or less, some a little more. Uh, but we have all above average in this room, right? Yeah. But still yet, there's so much more capacity that just our brains uh, have. And then our bodies, our bodies have a capacity that we're only operating about 10% of the capacity. Your DNA, your genetics, the way God designed our bodies is for every cell in our body to reproduce and to keep reproducing and to keep us young and to keep us whole and to keep healing and, 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 and wholeness continually flowing through us. But we understand that what happened to the, even to the genetics of mankind, in the Garden of Eden when Adam fell, Adam and Eve got evicted from the garden, it, it, affected, it affected even the genetics, the DNA of mankind. That's why when we get into 2 Corinthians chapter number 5, verse number 17, it says, but here's the restoration, here's the resolution. If anyone is in Christ, he is a new, he is a kainos creation, back to the original intent, plan, and purpose of God. See, you are not just made to function in the natural realm. You are not a natural being 
every once in a while having spiritual experiences. You are a spirit being first. Spirit, soul, body. You are a spirit. You have a soul, but you live in a body. But God never intended for you to be limited to your body. We see in Genesis, God spoke ten times. In Hebrew, the rabbis would say that there were ten dimensions that were, that were birthed out of what God said in Genesis chapter number one. And most of us are trying to figure out how to work in this dimension and in the natural realm, but there's other dimensions and realms of the spirit that we have an ability to walk and live and move in. Jesus said, if you walk in the spirit, you won't fulfill the lust of the flesh. How many know how to walk in the spirit so that what's taking place in the realm of the spirit starts manifesting in your natural body? Am I getting too deep out there for you this morning? Am I just coming out of the gate right too quick, just blowing your mind? If anybody is in Christ, if you are in Christ, you're a new creation, a new creature with new features. Old things are passed away. The limitations, the limiting thoughts, the limiting mindsets have got to go. We are coming into a time where Isaiah prophesied where the generations, the genetics, the DNA of mankind being restored back to the original intent, plan, and purpose of God. What would happen? Do you understand that your eyes have the ability to do things that they're not doing right now? Your brain has the ability to do things it's not doing right now. Your liver, your kidneys, your lungs, come on, your heart, the, your skin has the ability to do things that it's not functioning in right now. But when the people of God starts getting to the place to where they are arising to the God-given call and the original intent and plan and purpose, uh, understanding that we are seated in Christ and in Him, him we live, in Him we move, and in Him we have our being. Where is Jesus? He is everywhere. He is right here, and He is in heaven. He is in Africa, and He is in London. He is in Varnell, and He is in Dalton. He's everywhere. Well, if He is here, and He is also there, seated with Him in heavenly places, our Father, and you are in Him, where does that put you? I'm right here, preacher. Yeah, but if you are in Christ, you're also there. You're already at the right hand of the Father. You are wherever He is. The problem is, is your awareness of where you are in Him is often skewed so you don't have the understanding many times uh, that we have the reality of being seated with Him in heavenly places. So there is an identity crisis. What we see on the earth, identity theft and identity fraud is, I think, the number one crime committed right now globally. And I think it's just a mirror. It's just a reflection of what is taking place actually in the realm of the spirit. I'm here to tell you this morning and to prophesy to you, the enemy has tried to hijack your identity in the realm of the spirit. That's why people are looking for things. They're searching for things. I I love what Dr. Miles Monroe said. He said, people will preoccupy their self with religion until they find the kingdom. What every person on this planet is looking for. I feel the Holy Ghost up in here now. What the, every person is looking for is the kingdom of God. The kingdom was what was lost in the garden. It wasn't heaven that was lost in the garden. It was kingdom. It was dominion. The ability to have power over circumstances. It was the ability to go in and out of different dimensions and realms. Oh, man. <laughs> If you look at this, it says there was a tree in the center of the garden. If you go back to the original Hebrew, it says there was a tree that was centered in a realm that was elevated above the earth. <laughs> and he had the ability 
to move in and out of realms and dimensions. Am I, am I going too crazy for you this morning? <laughs> but we see if we are in Christ, we are a brand new creation. And the enemy has tried to hijack our identity and tell us that we are just human beings, just common, ordinary people, one of so many billion people on this planet. But the word says, if we are in Christ, there's something extraordinary that is on the inside of you. And it is Christ, Jesus Christ on the inside of you, the hope of glory. What is glory? The genetics, everything about you being restored just like it was in the Garden of Eden. Adam lost it, but Jesus came to get it back. How many wants everything that Jesus paid? the full price for us to have I want everything that he paid the full price for us to have so identity is being hijacked it's simply a mirror of what is taking place in the spirit but see the enemy messed up he couldn't stop you from being here today hearing a word about your identity in Christ and understanding that you have already got the victory. The battle has already been won. Jesus paid the price for your victory over 2,000 years ago at Mount Calvary. It is finished. The work of Jesus was enough. The blood of Jesus is enough. And now you're in him, so you're a new creation, a new creature with new features, Deborah said. All right, good introduction. So Matthew chapter number 9, we see a story here of two daughters. An older daughter and a younger daughter. We often talk about the prodigal son, the older son, and the younger son. But here is a story, a true story of two daughters, a younger daughter and an older daughter. Let's look at this, Matthew 9 and 18. He was willing, or Jesus, as he was telling them about these things, about the kainos creation, suddenly one of the leaders came and knelt down in worship before him saying, my daughter is near death, but come and lay your hand on her and she'll live. So Jesus and his disciples got up and followed him. Man, my ears feel like they are on fire. <laughs> Whew, man, I just want to flow in this for just a moment. Mm, Lord, you're good. Just then, a woman who had suffered from an issue of blood. I want to prophesy, pause. I want to prophesy right now over every issue that is going on with your blood right now. Whoever I'm talking to right now, it might be high cholesterol. It might be high white blood cells. It might be low. It might be high blood pressure. It might be low. Whatever is the issue in your blood right now, the issue in your blood, I speak healing and I speak wholeness over it right Right now, in the name of Jesus, we speak healing and wholeness over blood conditions, over everybody in this room, over everybody who is watching on live stream right now. I declare and decree a release of the anointing to begin to flow right now. Every issue dealing with blood, I just declare healing and wholeness over it. Right now, in the name of Jesus, whoever I'm talking to, go ahead and receive that. And thank God that it is done right now now in the name of Jesus. So then a woman who had suffered from an issue of blood bleeding for 12 years approached from behind and touched the tassel of his robe and she said in herself, if I can touch his robe, it'll be made well. But Jesus turned and saw her and said, have courage, daughter. <laughs> daughter. Only two times in the Bible Jesus calls and uses that word daughter. We'll deal with both of those this morning. Have courage, daughter. Your faith has made you well. The woman was made well, whole from that very moment. Jesus came to the leader's house, or Jairus' house. The flute players in the cloud was lamenting loudly. Leave, he said, because the girl isn't dead, but she's just sleeping. They started laughing at him. And when the crowd had been put outside, he went in and took her by the hand, and the girl got up. This news spread throughout the whole area. 
This passage of a tale of two daughters is, is, is given to us in Matthew chapter number 9, Mark chapter number 5, and Luke chapter number 8. And when you begin to take this passage, this story, from these three different gospel writers and begin to look at them, you begin to get a whole picture of what is going on in this story. There is a man by the name of Jairus, or Jairus, and he is coming to Jesus because his 12-year-old daughter is about to die. But at the same time this is taking place, there is another daughter, there is another woman who had been sick for 12 years. So you got two daughters. One daughter who had been dealing with an issue for 12 years and another daughter who was only 12 years old. You've got a younger one and an older one together in the same story. And they are tied together with this number 12. Watch this, watch this. The woman who had the issue for 12 years, she said within herself, if I can touch Jesus, I'll be made whole. But the 12-year-old little girl, she was in a condition not to approach Jesus, but Jesus was approached by her father. Now, what I like about this story is, one lady has her identity wrapped up in her issue, the issue of 12 years, and the other little girl is still developing in her identity. But both of them are being attacked in their identity. Now we've got a young girl who is being identified as a sick girl, a girl who is dying, and you've got an older woman who has her identity wrapped up in her issues. I want to tell you this morning, the Lord Jesus wants to break off the identity of your issues, the issues of the past over you today, here and now. He wants that identity to be removed. Watch this. One daughter touched the hem of the garment of Jesus, but the other daughter, Jesus went and touched her. I love it. You see so many different ways people are healed and receive supernatural results all through the Bible. I like it because it tells us there's no cookie cutter way that the Lord Jesus can move in all kinds of different ways to get the same result in you. And our problem a lot of times is we try to connect what needs to be done in our life now with something that he's already done. And if it don't look like something he's already done, we just go ahead and discount it as not being God. How many knows that God can move in different ways? He can do all kinds of things exceedingly and abundantly above all that we could ask or think. Regardless of the method, he still shows up. Now, if he's omnipresent, if he's always present, why do we say he shows up? If he's already here, what do we mean by that? When we say he showed up, we're not saying he wasn't here, but now he's here. When we say he showed up, or we're saying, come Lord Jesus, we're saying we know that you're already here, but we're asking you for the fullness of who you are with your power, with your glory, with your ability to perform miracles, signs, and wonders to begin to manifest manifest in the room because we know that you're already here so when we say come Lord Jesus we want more we want more what we're saying is we want more of the supernatural power of God operating in our life that would be so obvious to the world it can't be explained away it can mm. and we just had there should be so many things that happening in your life right now that you can't explain if you can explain everything that's happening in your life right now, either you're very brilliant or you're very limited. I don't know which. <laughs> but the first thing that we see in this story is Jairus. He has a daughter who's sick. And Jairus, or Jairus, comes to Jesus. And the first thing he does, he throws himself at the feet of Jesus and he begins to worship. That's in verse number 18 of chapter 9 of Matthew. But in the very next verse, it says, Then Jesus and the disciples started going to Jairus' house. Watch this. This tells me that Jesus always moves in the direction of our worship. He inhabits the praises of his people. 
He's the first character that we're introduced to in this story. And it begins by not, Jesus, I got a problem. He begins by him worshiping. And Jesus is like, what can I do for you? I just can't resist doing something for somebody who is a worshiper. What is it? What is it? What's going on? That's why when we really understand what worship is, somebody won't have to pump us. Somebody won't have to prime us. Uh, we'll just understand. As I worship, he inhabits. As I worship, he feels. As I worship, more of who he is feels me. As I worship, more begins to manifest in my life. This is profound. Jesus moves in the direction of worship. My question I want to ask you is what issue are, are you facing right now that can be resolved with genuine worship and thankfulness? You see, Jesus always moves in the, in the direction of worship. He can't resist it. He inhabits that worship. Would you just take a few moments right now and just worship him and just thank him. Lord, we worship you. We honor you. You are the king of glory. You are the prince of peace. You are El Shaddai. You are my savior. You are my healer. You are my provider. You are everything. You are he that was and is and is to come. You are everything. And I thank you for revealing more of who you are in this room right here to us today. In Jesus' name. So Jesus moves in the direction of worship. The second thing that we see in this passage, Jesus moves in the direction of worship, but you will always move in the direction of your confession. Jesus moves in worship, but you move according to your confession. You move in the direction of your confession. The woman with the issue moved in the direction of her confession. She said, if I can touch the hem of his garment, I will be made whole. In the original language, it says that she said within herself, or she began to imagine within herself what it would look like when she touched the hem of his garment. Now, she made up in her mind, when I do this, he's going to do that. I believe a lot of times we put too many stipulations or too many hurdles on God. We say, we say within ourselves, if I can just, if I can just fast long enough, if I can just get through this problem. If I can just get my marriage straightened out, if I can just get my crazy kids head on straight, if I can just, <laughs> if I can just, and, and we say all kinds of things, if I can just do this, then it's going to be a trickle effect and everything is going to get better. What if we just begin to say, Jesus said it, I believe it, and because that the circumstance is going to change, because the word says it. I believe if she just said, if I can get within 300 feet of Jesus, I'll be made whole. I believe if she said into her mind, into herself, as I'm sitting here in my house, because the word says in Psalms 107, he, his word, he sent his word and healed me of my disease. I'm healed of my disease because that's what the word said. She would have been whole right in her house. We have these ideas, if I can just go to this next big prophetic conference or, or this next big apostolic conference, or if I can just have a, this apostle or this prophet or this person lay their hands on me, everything is going to be fixed. What if we just put all that to the side and we understand we honor these men and women of God, but what if we put it to the side and say, I in my house, in my room, and in this house have access to the same Jesus, to the same Holy Holy Spirit, the same Spirit that raised Jesus from the dead lives on the inside of me. I don't have to go to California to get a miracle. I can go to my closet and I can get a miracle. She said within herself, what are you saying within yourself? This woman began to say something about her issue. She began to say something about it. James chapter number 3 describes our tongue in three different ways. He describes our tongue like a bridle for a horse's mouth, like a rudder for a ship, and like kindling to a fire. He said the same way that you put a bit or a bridle in a horse's mouth, 
me ever rode a horse before? Big old jokers. Kind of intimidating when you said on the, in the saddle. When you look at that joker and say, all that thing has to do is rear up and roll over like a steamroller and I'm gone. <laughs> but as big and as strong and as powerful as they are, their whole body is turned with a little bridle. As big and powerful as a ship is, the whole thing is controlled by one little rudder, controls the whole direction. We went on a couple of different cruises in our lifetime. And I remember thinking when we were first boarding a ship, getting on the ship, thinking about the whole dynamics of how all that works. Okay, the captain, he puts in where we're going to go. Boom, the computer tells the rudder which direction we need to go left, right, straight, whatever. How it needs it. And that rudder controls that whole ship. What if 30 minutes into that trip, I said, you know what, Heather, we ain't there yet. I think something's wrong. I think we need to get off this ship. <laughs> or what would happen in the middle of this, about an hour into it? We say, no, we need to go this way. No, we, and we just end up doing circles out in the ocean and never getting in our destination. I think a lot of people's lives are like that. Because originally they start speaking in a direction of faith, in a direction in alignment with the word of God. But when the storms come, when the resistance comes, when trials come, when troubles come, they start changing their confession. And then they start changing the direction of their life. And pretty soon they get on this habit of speaking faith. And then I don't know. I'm speaking faith. I don't know. I'm speaking. And they sit here their whole life just spinning around in circles. Uh, and under not even knowing that it is their tongue that is the rudder of their life and controlling the direction. I can tell where you're going by listening to what's coming out of your mouth. I tell you, I was in the office this morning praying over the service again and I heard y'all out here with these confessions uh, and my antennas went up and I was like, oh, come on, talk about that word right there. I am a victor. I am a conqueror. I am healed. I am blessed. I am delivered. I am the child of God. I am. See, those I am confessions are some of the most powerful confessions that you can make. That's why you got to stop saying, I am sick. I am depressed. No, 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 no. You are not sick. You are not depressed. You're going through a valley right now, but what you are is a blood-bought child of God with the blood of Jesus. You might be going through sickness, but you're not defined by sickness. You might be going through a struggle, but that's not who you are. You are who he says you are. <laughs> there was something that happened with her voice when she said, this week while I was meditating on this, Holy Spirit just spoke to me and said, your frequency unlocks features. Your voice has a frequency. When you begin to let your voice come into alignment with the frequency, with the sound of heaven, it begins to unlock features in your life that was inaccessible. That's why the enemy wants to silence your voice. That's why everybody else can have a platform and have a microphone and say whatever they want to anywhere. But you let a blood-bought saint of God get a microphone and say that sin is sin and wrong is wrong. And there is only one name whereby must we be saved. And it's at the name of Jesus that every knee is going to bow and every tongue is going to confess. People start getting squeamish. People start running. People start saying, demons start manifesting. Come on now. Why? Because there is only one name given under heaven where Whereby we must be saved, and it's the name of Jesus. It's the name of Jesus. It's the name of Jesus. Now, do we all have it all together, and do we all have it all figured out? No, not one of us do. We know in part, and we prophesy in part. 
And we're working through this thing. And we're navigating through this. And we are being transformed by the renewing of our mind. But it is a process. We've not arrived yet. I mean, where he said, Jesus said, these things that I'm doing, you're going to do. And even greater things, that gets me pumped. That gets me excited. Because Jesus walked on water. Jesus raised multiple people from the dead. Every time we go into the lake, Brian, we're trying to walk on water. We ain't done that yet. But we're going to, and, and fly. <laughs> we got to add flying. <laughs> I mean, Jesus, when they, were trying to, when they were trying to push him off the side of the cliff, it said, it said that Jesus turned and walked right through the midst of them. If you look at the Hebrew word, it literally means he walked right through them. You understand, he phased out of the natural realm. <laughs> and he literally walked right through them. The same way that later he walks through walls, he walks through. What's going to happen when people start phasing out and somebody's trying to kill you and you just phase out? Just... <laughs> and you just walk right through the middle of them. Somebody needs to get some police over here. Am I stretching your mind too much? I'm saying if Jesus did it, and he's the prototype of the new creation, and as he is, so are we, when are we going to start doing it? I don't know, but we're getting close. I feel like we're getting close. I think, I think we, the, the, the pattern in the book of Acts is we hear about it, we see it, and then we experience. They heard a sound. They saw the fire. They experienced the manifestation of being able to speak in other languages as the Spirit. They heard, they saw, and they experienced. I believe we're in phase one. <laughs> we're hearing about what is possible. Next, we're going to see it. And next, we're going to experience it for ourselves. Who am I talking to in this room? <laughs> Woo! Mm. So your Bible says that when this woman touched the hem of his garment, it said that she was healed. She was healed the very second she touched him. But Jesus turns around to her and says, Daughter, your faith has made you whole. Her faith, this is worth writing, her faith got her a miracle. But when Jesus spoke to her and told her she was a daughter, she started becoming whole. There's a difference between being healed and being whole. There were ten lepers that came to Jesus and he healed all ten of them. As they were walking, one of them came back and was grateful and was thankful. And your Bible says, and that guy was made whole. Leprosy ate your body, it ate your flesh, it ate your fingers off, it ate your toes off, it ate your ears off. If you were healed of leprosy, you still might have a missing finger or a missing toe or a missing ear, but there's no active leprosy in your body because you got healed. But if you're made whole, everything that the leprosy took away is back restored like it was never missing. You see, a lot of people stop short when they get a healing, when they could be made whole. And I want to tell you, God wants to make some people whole. He don't want to just heal you. Come on and take five seconds and give God a shout of praise. He wants to make you whole, Jason. Come on. Don't stop short of just getting healed. Get it all. Get whole. Her wholeness hinged to the words of Jesus in her identity no longer being identified by her issue, but now being identified as a daughter. As soon as she was identified as a daughter, it said she was whole. She got healed, then she got whole. She got healed, and she got whole. 
But the wholeness was the result of her identity. Do we really understand that we are identified in Christ? Next thing. Number four, virtue flows through the conduit of faith. Now, when this woman touched him, Jesus turned around and said, Who touched me? Because he felt virtue, it said. Go out of his body. This same word for virtue is the Greek word dunamis that's used in Acts 1.8. You will receive power. You will receive dunamis when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. And he says Jesus felt that dunamis, virtue, power flowed out of his body. This word dunamis is power to bring new possibilities. Do you understand the new possibilities that are all around you because Holy Spirit is hovering over you and breathing on you and breathing on you and breathing on you and breathing on you? And he's saying, he's saying, receive this power. Receive this ability to change circumstances. Receive this ability to receive new possibilities. It also means power to perform miracles power to influence and power for wealth. Do you realize that we are the people of God need to be the wealthiest people on this planet? We need to be so wealthy in peace, so wealthy in joy, so wealthy in love, uh, so wealthy in forgiveness, uh, so wealthy in long suffering. Uh, y'all, ain't, y'all ain't helping me preach out right here because you waiting for me to talk about money before you get excited. But I want to tell you, he wants you to be full of peace and joy. Uh, so so, so when he gives you some resources, uh, you, don't, you don't go crazy. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. So he was so aware. I love what Bill Johnson said. He said, how aware of the presence of Holy Spirit do you have to be to know that somebody is pulling and making a demand on what you got going on? What are you pulling on? Who are you pulling on? You trying to pull on a preacher? You trying to pull on a pastor? You trying to, oh, I'm, I'm, I'm just saying, I'm just asking. Are you trying to pull from the source? I want to pull from the source. I respect you and I honor you and I respect and I honor men and women of God. But I don't want to put my faith and my hope in other men and women of God. Because if I put my faith and my hope in people, people's going to let me down. If you put your faith and hope in me, I'm going to let you down. I promise you, I will. I promise I'll do something. I'll say something. You won't like it. You're going to get offended. You're going to go somewhere. But if you put your hope and your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and you're looking at him and I'm looking at him and we're looking at him and we're moving in that same direction because we're looking at him uh, we're going to be too busy looking at him than to get offended with each other yeah so number five Jesus got into Jairus Jairus's house I want to call him both names (laughs) I don't know which one to say so I'll say both When he got to the house, the girl had already died. And there were mourners set up. And the Bible says that they were making a lot of noise. (laughs) They were making some noise, but it wasn't our kind of noise. And Jesus comes into the place and he tells the mourners to leave. My question is, is... Why do we want to keep sharing our issues with people who are incapable of helping us? Why do we want to keep inviting people into our rooms, into our spheres of influence, who have no ability to help the situation? They want to only want to add to the sorrow. They want to, oh, yeah, yeah, it's getting bad. Oh, have you saw what's going on? Have you saw what's going on in the Middle East? Have you saw, man, it's just going to keep work, getting worse and worse. Gas prices are going to go up to $20 a gallon. Stock market is going to crash. There's going to be tornadoes going to kill all of us. Might be some sharks in them tornadoes too. I don't know. I mean, you, you have people. You have 
have the mourners come in and man they'll take your sorrow to a higher level I mean you thought you had it bad until they get on board and then you really think oh my god this thing is really bad and we invite that into our spaces, into our rooms. But the first thing when Jesus showed up did, uh, he said, all that's got to go. Every bit of it's got to go. Every bit of that. Because it's not a time to mourn. It's a time to rejoice. It's not a time to mourn. I'm prophesying to you. Who am I talking to? Uh, you got to stop mourning. You got to stop feeling sorry for yourself. Uh, and it's time to rejoice uh, and get your praise on. <laughs> yeah. Who's going to help me? Who's going to help me? <laughs> oh, the mourners got to go. We're not looking to the negativity. We're not looking. Our eyes are not focused on the problems. We are aware, but we're not focused on that. We're so focused on Jesus that what we're seeing around us that we're aware of don't move us because we know he's bigger. <laughs> and so we have to make room. Which brings me to number five. Make room for the miracle worker. Just elbow your neighbor and say, make room for the miracle worker. Yeah, y'all got to forgive me. I hadn't been able to preach in this pulpit in two weeks now. And I feel like I got some overflow to give you this morning. <laughs> All right, I got 16 more points and we're done. <laughs> I'll do it. You know I will. <laughs> Number six, they were astonished. When Jesus come back with the girl, when Jesus come back, with the girl who was dead and now she's alive and everybody else thought it was over and everybody else thought it was done and everybody else was ready to put her in the cemetery and everybody else was ready to put her in the ground and everybody else was ready to put her in the moor and everybody else had written you off and everybody else had said you're never going to make it and everybody else said you can't do it to, you can't do your own business you can't get married and be happy you can't do this, you can't do that I'm here to tell you uh, God's saying put the mourners out of the room because Jesus is in in the room we're making room for Jesus who am I preaching to right now we making room for Jesus making room for Jesus Make, <laughs> making room for Jesus I, I don't have to be around those voices anymore that have a problem for every solution you come up with. I ain't got time for that. I need to be surrounded with somebody that has a little bit of faith and said, Oh, I know what you're going through is tough. I'm not denying that there is an issue. But what I am denying is it's right to continue to be an issue because the miracle worker is in the room and nothing's too hard for him. He said, when Jesus come up with the girl, they were all astonished. I'm prophesying to you right now. Your world is about to be astonished. The people in your world, the people in your sphere of influence, about to be astonished because you've made up in your mind, I'm putting the mourners out. I'm making room for Jesus. If it's just me and Jesus, we got this thing. We got this thing. We can do it. All of them were so astonished because their faith was in the fact that it was over. But Jesus' faith was in the fact that I am the resurrection and life. 
And if you'll just believe on me, the thing that everybody else said was dead, I can bring it back to life. I can bring a lung back to life. I can bring a kidney back to life. I can bring a pancreas back to life. Come, who am I talking to right now? I can bring a spinal cord back to life. I can bring your finances back to life. I can bring your blood back to life. Tell your neighbor, he can even bring your brain back to life. <laughs> I know you lost a few brain cells. <laughs> Listen, we won't get into that, but we all know we lost some brain cells doing some crazy stuff. But you know what? Jesus can even restore that. the anointing just just like the Holy Spirit just saying restoring brain cells yes Lord every one of them every one of them <laughs> restoring hair follicles <laughs> when I come back next week with an afro you're gonna know Jesus is alive <laughs> Man, I knew it was going to be crazy <laughs> But I'm prophesying to you, get ready to be astonished at what will happen when you start making room for Jesus. When you understand that your worship causes Him to move and that your confession causes you to move. You'll start combining your worship with confessions of faith and you'll start making room for Jesus uh, and you'll realize there will be nothing that is too hard for Him. Nothing will be impossible for Him. Uh, ever, uh, you know that you have a renewed mind when impossible situations look possible. <laughs> it's like... I'm Somebody sent me a picture and said, maybe this person had a renewed mind. It was, it was pretty funny because it was, a it was a dead deer on the side of the road and somebody tied a balloon to its hoof and said, get well soon. <laughs> well, somebody, somebody believing for that thing to make a recovery. So, or they're making a joke, but what if, what if the thing got up? I'm just saying, we have to renew our minds to the fact that there's no limitations, no impossibilities. And so, well, I believe Jesus can raise somebody from the dead, but you got to get to them before they get embalmed. I'm thinking, man, if Jesus can raise a dead person from the dead, what does a little embalming fluid have to do with it? Because if he can turn water into wine, I believe he can turn embalming fluid back into blood. We got to keep, we got to keep these limiting mindsets out and see that nothing's too hard for him. So there's a tale of two daughters, one with the issue for 12 years and one who was only 12 years old, but Jesus got to both of them. The only other time in the scripture that Jesus calls a woman a daughter was in Luke chapter number 13 and 16. And it was about a woman who had been bound for 18 years. And he told her, woman, you are loose from your infirmity. Woman, thou art loose. You know, Big Jake's talking about woman, thou art loose. He preached the snot out of that scripture. I mean, he preached for about four years on that scripture. This woman being a daughter of Abraham who has been bound for 18 years, shouldn't she be loose from this bond on the Sabbath day? And I don't care how long you've been bound by whatever you've been bound by. God sent me to tell you, should you stay bound on this Sabbath day? My answer is no. 
you shouldn't stay. You shouldn't stay bound another day in your life. If you are a son and you are a daughter of God who are declaring, I am not going to be bound another day in my life, would you just stand to your feet right now and just begin to thank God that you are identified in Christ. In Christ you live, in Christ you move, in Christ you have your being. Uh, and there is no limitations. There's nothing too hard for Him. There is nothing impossible for God. The same God that healed, the same God that delivered and set free in the Bible is the same God that is in this room right now and we're making room for him and we're putting out the ideas and the thoughts that are limiting uh, we're putting out the ideas and the thoughts that are not in agreement and in alignment with the word of God we're putting out everything we're casting down every thought and imagination that would exalt itself against the knowledge of God and we're declaring uh, let it be on earth in in my life just like it is in heaven no limitations I am fully furnished fully supplied mm.